Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Legally Live. I'm your host, McKinley Malasa, criminal defense attorney in Austin, Texas. Today, we are going to be doing the day six, part two recap of the Caitlin Armstrong trial. And I forgot to mention at the end of the last video, um, but I actually left the courtroom at lunchtime on day six. And so um, we are going to, I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to read through Brianna Hollis's tweets because she was one of the reporters in the courtroom. Alex from News Nation also left at uh, the lunch break that day. So this is what we have to go off of. Um, I have read the, through these before, so um, hopefully this will work. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share this screen. Also, um, if you want to, if you're not familiar with the case, go ahead and check out my playlist. I have an arm, uh, Caitlin Armstrong trial playlist where I've been recapping court after each session. Okay. Let's, let's see here. Okay. So after the lunch break, the first witness on the stand was Elizabeth Stone King. She was the interpreter from the DA's office and she testified to documents that were found uh, on Armstrong's devices and in her possession that were in Spanish. And uh, they had to do with the cosmetic surgery. So it was a lot of planning with the cosmetic surgeon's office and the pricing, that type of stuff when it came to her nose job. And it turns out also a brow lift. Let's see here. So there's a bill of service for an Allison Page and APD detective Katie Connor earlier had testified that she saw a document with Allison Page's name on it in her suitcase when she was arrested. And, or when it got brought back from Costa Rica. And also it had that AVA clinic, the sur like the cosmetic surgeon clinic on it, and the name Jorge Badia, which was apparently the surgeon's name. Then there's a price for one of the packages that matches a service receipt from Costa Rica that we saw during someone else's testimony. And we saw that during... Hmm. The receipt was during the iPhone, uh, the iCloud dump testimony because this receipt showed up, but it also actually showed up in the document. It was for 6,000, whatever that was introduced through Katie Connor. But we also saw the, this package receipt show up in her iCloud dump. Now there's an online chat between Allison Page, which is Caitlin, and Jorge Badia, and she's asking if there's availability tomorrow. And then this is just a note about what Armstrong and her attorney were doing. Throughout the conversation with the surgeon's office, Allison Page asked multiple times if the surgeon will be able to throw in some extra filler. She apparently really wanted filler like under her eyes and in her cheeks, and I believe she wanted her chin to find more. Um, she apparently at one point even mentions that she had aged. She felt like she had aged a lot in the last couple of days, which is, you know, not a good look. Then they viewed post-op photos uh, that Armsh and Armstrong shares a few words with her attorney and then looks back down. The state passes the witness, defense's turn. So some of these post-op photos were actually of her on the operating table because they got these from Jorge Badia's clinic because he took pictures after he, he took pictures of her after he did her surgery, right? Because doctors do that, like while she was still on the operating table. And she apparently refused to have her photos taken for, so if you have cos cosmetic surgery, at least here in the States, and apparently also in Costa Rica, what they do, if you ever go on a cosmetic surgeon's website, you'll see before and after photos. So a lot of times when you go and have any kind of cosmetic procedure, like if you're getting filler or anything, they'll ask you at the beginning for um, your consent to post this stuff on their um, on their website, right? And she apparently, well, they want 
consent to take the photos so that they can put they can use them for their advertising purposes basically and so she had uh refused those photos however in the actual surgeon's file you know they're allowed to take photos of you and keep those in their medical file whenever um they do the surgery and so that's apparently where these photos came from the state passes the witness and then it's the defense's turn and um there was this is confusing testimony but it was or at least tweets about the testimony, but apparently the, the point of the defense was they were just saying like, you can't actually verify the office authenticity of the documents. And she says, I only translated, I can only testify to the work that I've done. And then the next witness was a very important witness. It was APD detective Daniel Portnoy. And he was the digital forensics unit detective that is going to testify about the GPS. So he goes through all his training. They uh, also have him, uh, they establish that he's an expert for extracting data from mobile, digital, and infotainment devices. And he then starts addressing the electronic evidence he examined in this case, which included iPhones, two laptops. I thought it was an iPad also, but I don't see that listed here. And um the infotainment center. And then he also addresses the secret services help in extracting the iPhone 11 pro. And because we did hear earlier this day from the secret service agent about using gray key. Um, and then it says Portnoy mentions one of the devices had very high level of encryption. I think that there were multiple devices that had high levels of encryption. I think Mo Wilson and Caitlin Armstrong's computers could neither one be extracted, or at least they couldn't actually read the data because they were encrypted. Uh, we're once again getting into the, <laughs> to the weeds about digital forensics. Uh, So just talking about being able to, so trying to brute force the cell phone open about how that would impact the actual data that you get. And it it's just that you won't get data, right? Or you will get a lot less data, but it won't add data. Uh, Portnoy addresses knowledge of GPS data being held in the infotainment system of Armstrong's Jeep. And then they start looking at photos of different steps that he took. And apparently he also showed the tools that he used in order to open up the infotainment center to perform the extraction. Then he, they uh, pull up an extraction report for the navigation events, which come from her vehicles infotainment center. And, um, on they, they pull up specifically May 11th. So this is admitted into evidence. And specifically, they discuss Track 99, which is one of the uh, trips that she took on May 11th, and it starts at 7.04 p.m. There is then a uh, animation that is offered and admitted into evidence, and it is going to depict track 99 and then I guess also track 100. And this is apparently over an hour long animation. And it, it, it tracks from the time that she turns on her car until the time that she turns off her car. And they say that that actual period of time is well over an hour. However, the DA here is going to fast forward it to like key times. So you can kind of see what happened from the time she left the house that night to the time that she got back to her house that evening. So they start looking at the uh, data from the two, from track 99. And it appears that at first she's starting at a neighborhood in South Austin. And then um, it has her driving up South Lamar headed North. They pause the video and they have the detective readout that the time is 7.20 p.m. and it's May 11th, 2022. There has to be more than that, though.
Huh. Okay. So I know there's more than this. So this is crazy. But anyway, hold on one second and I will just get my notebook and start reading it to you. Hold on. Okay. I'm back. Sorry about that. I'm just going to read from my notes because I have collected this information from the testimony from that day. And so the uh, Portnoy also mentions that he has verified the GPS with surveillance cameras to make sure that the information is correct. And um, he says that the pa there's pauses shown in the animation, and he says that that's consistent with regular traffic. Uh, when they paused the screen earlier, when he she was headed north on South Lamar, apparently she was just south of Barton Springs Road, which is very close to downtown in Austin, right? Uh, he says the, the vehicle ha has traveled to the downtown area by, oh, so the next point is it travels uh, downtown in by the Whole Foods, which is off of Fifth Street. And then it, the state says that she, the vehicle alters its, its path. And he says that it actually uh, takes a side street to uh, turn the other direction. And it took a side street to go eastbound, right? Because she was headed westbound at first. So she was headed um, west on 6th Street. And then she turns down a side street so that she can go eastbound. And Portnoy says that um, it looks like the vehicle made a circle around the block because at 729, she's traveling now. She's traveling down West 5th going east. So because 6th Street and 5th Street are one-way streets, you do have to actually turn on a side street if you want to head in the opposite direction. So if you're headed west and you want to go east, you're going to have to go down a side street. And so that's what she does. And then at 735, the vehicle is approaching I-35. And um, then the vehicle goes on I-35. It turns right onto MLK Boulevard, which is to the east and headed in the direction of Caitlin Cash's apartment. It then turns on to Cedar. And then after that, it's going to turn on to Maple. There's a blue line shown on the animation, which is just to show how the vehicle was traveling down Maple Street. And you see it moving down Maple Avenue. He says the vehicle travels down various blocks in the immediate area, but does not actually leave the neighborhood. The vehicle circles over the same area multiple times. From 752 to 755, he says that the vehicle may have been at rest because the track log continues running. He says that this indicates that the electronics of the vehicle were still on, but he can't tell anything else. The speed of the vehicle once again increases. Uh, it's in the same location, but it starts moving again at 8.05. And he says that it's on 18th Street, or actually it is, you see it on the animation, it's on 18th Street, and then it goes to Maple again. And remember, 1708 Maple is the address of the house where this occurred. However, if you were to look on Google Maps, it would appear that where the garage apartment steps are, which you can only access those from that alley off of Maple, is it appears when you click on the area where the stairs are that it's 1704 Maple. That's what Google Maps will tell you, but 1704 doesn't exist. But that's where these steps are. That's what Google has assigned it, okay? Um, then he also says that he compared this with the surveillance videos that show the vehicle they believe is Caitlin's traveling in the area and they, they matched it up with her GPS and they say that it's accurate within four seconds. So that is pretty accurate. At 8.08, the vehicle travels down 16th. It keeps going around the general area. By 8.29 PM, the vehicle is at 18th and Chestnut. He, Portnoy explains the vehicle is stationary. At 8.37, Portnoy says the vehicle appears to be at the alley by Maple. Now, right before this, for a period of time, like a couple of minutes, I believe, there were all three of their phones were within 200 feet of each other. So that means that Caitlin's vehicle 
what the state is claiming is that it was in the same area as Mo and Holland, either as they're traveling home or most likely while they were in the alley dropping off Mo is what I would think that, you know, Caitlin had to have just been sitting there watching, lurking from somewhere within 200 feet, which is terrifying. Um, at 840, Portnoy says the track point ended and the final point is by a grassy area or a parking area nearby. It's also right next to the alley by Maple Avenue. And like I said, earlier testimony told us that's the only way to get to Caitlin Cash's apartment. Also, this resting point, the part this is like her parking spot, is also they testified that this is very near where the bicycle was found in the bamboo forest uh, outside Cash's apartment where it had been discarded, right? So it appears like it was discarded right by the same place that Caitlin's vehicle was parked. The new track on May 11th, 2022 starts at 9.17 p.m. And if you will recall the video from the neighbor's ring doorbell where you hear the audio of the two screams and followed by two shots and then a pause and then another shot that started at 9 15. So two minutes later, her vehicle takes off apparently at a very high rate of speed. And then the track of the, the vehicle track heads westbound on 17th street. The vehicle drives northbound on I-35, and that's still the case by 9.24 p.m., but at 9.26, Portnoy says that the vehicle used an underpass to go on Frontage Road on I-35, heading in the opposite direction. So it uses an underpass under the 290 overpass, I guess, to go to use the Frontage Road to go back south on our I-35, because remember... Um, Caitlin and Colin's home is located south. So she's going to need to get back south, right? Continues traveling down I-35 by 931. She is in the downtown area. She's then passing St. Edwards at 936. The vehicle left I-35 and made a turn on Battle Bend Boulevard. At 937, Portnoy says the vehicle briefly stopped. I believe this is where they're saying that she pulled in to the apartment complex that was located very close to their home. And when they went back and tracked where specifically the vehicle stopped at the apartment complex, it was apparently right next to the dumpster. Um, the vehicle resumed driving at 942 and turned south on a side street. It was stationary for another period of time, and then at 946, it resumed driving. At 947, it pour, pulled slightly off the road, and by 948, the track log ends. And it stopped on Fort Clark Drive, which is where Caitlin and Colin live. So... So that was basically the end of the testimony for the afternoon on day six. The obviously the most important things that came of that was the animation that showed Caitlin, Caitlin's vehicle was in the area of Caitlin Cash's apartment for a, a long time before Caitlin, before um, Mo and Colin had even left Pullbook. Pool burger. Um, she's already over there waiting on them, right? And so then also to find out that their their phones were all within 200 feet of each other for a period of time is quite shocking. Um, and then to also see how many times she made the block and just continued to circle and circle and circle. And I don't know what she was waiting on, but then to park and who knows what happened from the time that the vehicle stopped. I think that's a 30 minute period, right? From the time that the vehicle stopped and parked, maybe a little over 30 minutes actually, and then actually took off for good from that area. Um, you know, it was a long time and that's creepy to think about. And it, it was quite chilling to learn that bit of information that there was 
that much time. That's why I think a jury would not have a hard time returning a verdict quickly in this case, because when you see how much time there was to talk yourself out of doing something like this, like if you're really, really angry, you know, you have plenty of like, it's just, it seems so cold, right? So that had to have been very difficult for her family to realize. Hopefully her, I'm sure her family already knew that before it came out in testimony, but um, just super sad, super duper sad. All right. Well, um, hopefully you were able to catch everything that I said. <laughs> Um, and sorry about not putting that in the last video. I kind of forgot, uh, but go ahead and like, and subscribe, go check out the playlist, share this with anybody that you know, that's interested in the Caitlin Armstrong trial and, uh, definitely comment and come back. Thanks. Bye.